All right, good morning. We're on the record on cases CR 22-211623, State of Idaho v. Chad Guy Daybell, and cases 22-211624, State v. Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell. Before we get started here, I want to confirm our remote appearances. We have Mr. Pryor. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Daybell, can you hear me as well? All right. Confirm then. We're doing this hearing in person today as an in-person court hearing. However, I've allowed for the appearance by Zoom of both the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and his counsel based on the shortened time frame of the notice for this hearing, which has continued over from a hearing we had on Monday of this week. Present here in the courtroom, Mrs. Vallow Daybell with counsel, Mr. Archibald, Mr. Wood, and Ms. Blake are here on behalf of the state. This morning, this is a hearing, and I'll also just advise that we do have our ongoing courtroom conduct order that's in effect in this case. Pursuant to the terms of that order, any recording of any audio or visual images of this hearing is strictly prohibited. Please make sure that your phones are either silenced or off. If any phone goes off or disrupts the proceedings, it may be subject to being taken by the bailiff in the case. Your Honor, I'm sorry. I see nine attendees on Zoom and only three cameras, so maybe we can identify who else is attending via Zoom. Okay. On Zoom, what I'm seeing is a courtroom two camera. There's one window for me, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Daybell, the clerk, your co-counsel, John Thomas, I believe, is listening in, and maybe you're not able to see the names I am. The trial court administrator, Tammy White, is also appearing. We've got a window for staff attorney. Is that you? Okay. My staff attorney has her computer on that, and then Rocky Wixom is also apparently listening in on this hearing for the state as one of the prosecutors appearing. So those are the attendees that are here on the Zoom proceedings this morning. And I do authorize specifically each one of those attendees to be present remotely for the hearing, but, of course, admonishing anyone that is appearing that you're not allowed to in any way record or disseminate any broadcast that you may have through your devices of this hearing because it's an open hearing, but it's not subject to any kind of redistribution of the Zoom signal. All right. This is a hearing that has been continued from earlier Monday this week to today after the court received word that an additional DNA report of evidence was received during that emergency hearing we had Monday. It was a second report. We were advised of that during a hearing we were in on Monday, February 27th, and that was during a closed sealed portion of the hearing where we were talking specifically about the DNA evidence. At this time, the court, or at that time, the court elected to continue the hearing to today so that we would have time to allow counsel to review the new report and also to offer any argument in furtherance of pending motions to compel the motion to sever filed by Mr. Daybell and the motion to dismiss filed by Mr. Daybell's counsel in this case. We heard all of those on February 23rd. However, with the subsequent information that's been received, the court would like to again reopen for any additional argument to make. And as it relates to those pending motions, I do want to hear argument from defense counsel as well as from the state. I intend to make some rulings on some of these pending motions this morning after arguments are completed. So at this time, the court in reviewing the file, it also appears there was an additional discovery disclosure that was filed by the state on February 27th. I don't know if any of that goes into any argument that would be scheduled for today, but that's the other development that's occurred since our hearing on Monday. At 
At this time, then, what I'd like to do is reopen for any argument subsequent to our last hearing on your pending motions. Uh, Mr. Pryor, I'll start with you. You had the three pending motions, a motion to compel that was filed February 7th, the motion to sever filed February 13th, and your motion to dismiss filed February 10th. Uh, based on any new disclosures, do you have any additional argument to make in support of any of those motions at this time? You're on mute, Mr. Pryor. And again, again, Judge, I'm sorry. Yes, if, if I may, Judge. Go ahead. Judge, the um, uh, motion to compel uh, is, 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 I think, is resolved. I got a, a, a correspondence from the prosecuting attorney's uh, office uh, yesterday saying that the um, 12 terabytes of evidence has now been downloaded to the, uh, um, the hard drive that I provided to them. Uh, that I can come and pick that up at any time, and I responded that I would do that. Obviously, I'm in Boise today, and uh, I'm not at liberty to go down there today and, and pick that up, but uh, I anticipate picking that up shortly. Uh, so as far as that's concerned, they provided the 12 terabytes of evidence. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the motion to compel in regards to that is resolved. Uh, reviewing those 12 terabytes of evidence is a different story, and and um, <clears throat> I'm obviously going to need some time to do that. Uh, the court is correct that uh, I believe on Monday um, there was additional disclosure of another supplemental discovery. Uh, my office was provided a, um, a, a FedEx note uh, just yesterday. Uh, I was out of the office yesterday, but the note was uh, delivered to my office saying that I'm uh, um, able to go to the FedEx office in Boise and pick up the discovery, which is the 11th or, the, excuse me, the 13th supplement. Uh, I was provided an addendum. Uh, there are a significant number of items on that, including witness interviews and, and uh, statements by various witnesses. I'm not at liberty at this point to uh, uh, discuss uh, the details of how involved that is. What I do know is that there are additional uh, discovery items, and there are a numerous number of them that are also going to need to be uh, processed and go through. And again, Judge, I anticipate picking that up at, right after this hearing and uh, uh, having my uh, team start the process of going through um, that most recent disclosure of even more evidence from the state. I'm sure they can... Uh, identify what that is, and, and um, I would assume Mr. Archibald will respond to that. <clears throat> Judge, I'm, I, I think in, in um, regards to my Brady motion to dismiss, I've discussed that in enough detail that the court has an idea of, uh, of uh, my, what my argument is. I do want to touch again, Judge, on this motion to sever. Uh, my concern is this, Judge, is that the DNA evidence that was disclosed back in late December, obviously there wasn't an opportunity for um, uh, me to have an independent test done. And, 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 Judge, even if I got that evidence in December, uh, I would probably still not have a report ready uh, identifying the, the manner in which I was going to have my office tested. We agreed to a uh, to an expert by uh, the prosecuting attorney. They provided that evidence, uh, uh, you know, a short time ago, and then lo and behold, Judge, at the hearing last uh, Tuesday, uh, we get another report. Obviously, um, the significance of that is this, is that evidence uh, – provides, uh, at least from my um, uh, perspective, an explanation potentially of, uh, uh, of where Mr. Daybell and I are going to go in this particular case. Uh, I need to have an opportunity to test that evidence. I need to have an opportunity to conduct actually uh, the uh, STR and the uh, uh, genealogical study of that evidence. Uh, Dr. Hempinkian has made it clear through his declaration, which uh, I haven't seen any declaration from any other expert or any response, but he's going to need at least 60 days. And, and frankly, Judge, the, the nature of that DNA evidence is going to require even more time. I'm, that 60 days is only going to start once I get possession of that evidence and I get all of the technical data uh, that I need to receive from the state. Now, uh, I'm not going to pick on the state today to everybody's surprise, but quite frankly, Judge, uh, receiving that technical data is going to take some time, and the state's going to have to at least to some extent cooperate in me getting that data. I can't speak to the level of cooperation they're going to give me, but in any, in any event, I have a right 
to test brand new DNA evidence. I have a right to test and question this most recent report. And the most recent report, Judge, uh, came in on Tuesday of, of this week. Uh, I have not even had a chance to, to, to deal with that with Dr. Hampinkian. Uh, we've been able to, we've been unable to, to communicate at this point regarding that most recent report. But I take some issues. Mr. Thomas spoke of that last week about some of the issues he, he takes with the, the, the representations made by the state's expert. Well, I take issues with representations made by the state's expert in that report as well. And I'm going to need to challenge all of that evidence and, and, and it's going to take some time. Uh, Mr. Daybell, this, this isn't just a, uh, a phone call or an interview with a witness, uh, or a, a, uh, you know, a, a, a document that wasn't provided from the state. We have plenty of that as well. We have a significant amount of evidence. The state is, as, 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 for whatever reason, and it doesn't matter the reason, has provided a lot of, uh, evidence very, very, very late in the, in this proceeding. But when you're talking about DNA evidence, that's a whole different uh, item. That is something that takes a significant amount of time and a significant amount of effort to evaluate. And this could have profound, a profound impact on this case. This isn't just a, 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 a an insignificant piece of information. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into specific details, and I, I agree with the court that that's highly imp- inappropriate. That just fuels all the speculation out there, and we don't need to do that. But, Judge, we are talking about a significant piece of information, a piece of information that would have a profound impact on how this case uh, proceeds and, and, and how the defense and the state present this case. I can't overemphasize the, the significance of, of what this information means. Uh, at that point, Judge, I think it's imperative that the court provide me an opportunity to do that. Now, if Mr. Archibald and Mr. Thomas uh, don't want to do that because Ms. Vallo Daybell does not want to uh, waive her speedy trial, well, that's her choice to do that. Um, I'm not going to speak for Mr. Archibald or Mr. Thomas, but uh, I am going to speak for Mr. Daybell, and he wants this thing set out so that I can have an adequate amount of time to uh, uh, to review this and to, to draw our own conclusions from what this evidence uh, um, uh, provides. And again, Judge, it's highly significant. And given that, Judge, I can't see any other alternative than, than to give Mr. Daybell that opportunity to have an independent testing of this information, uh, independent evaluation, independent report. And, and frankly, Judge, I, I my gut belief is that we're going to come up with a little bit of a different conclusion than what the state's going to recommend or the state's documents represent. Now, I, I'm not an expert, uh, but uh, at least on a cursory view of this evidence, it, it seems to suggest something other than what the state's representing. So at this point, Judge, I'm going to renew my motion to uh, sever and ask the court to please allow us to have an opportunity to, to conduct that uh, further investigation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Uh, what I'm going to do is allow at this point for defense counsel also for uh, the companion case on Ms. Vallow's case to present any further argument, and then I'll hear a response from the state after that. So, uh, Mr. Archibald, would you like to present any further additional arguments subsequent to our hearing last week? Your Honor, we're uh, disappointed that the state held on to this evidence for so long without uh, notifying the, the two defendants here of the evidence against them. Disappointed that they... Uh, thought that they could be the sole judge of what's exculpatory and what's inculpatory. Uh, so this evidence has been held by the state for undue periods of time, and that's what finds us here. That's what finds Mr. Pryor asking for more time. If my client waived speedy trial, I would also be asking for more time. But since she has held that right and held it close to her, I have to respect that due uh, to the constitutional autonomy that she has. So I 
agree that Mr. Pryor has the right to have this DNA evidence independently examined, that there's not enough time for that to be done between now and trial. I agree with Mr. Pryor that this is not the defendant's fault. It's not the defendant's attorney's fault. The blame for it rests solely upon the state. And so when the government holds evidence and refuses to turn it over, either because they're playing cute or they're playing ignorant, as Mr. Pryor has argued, the responsibility still is on them. And so similarly to the DNA evidence, this disclosure this week is really disappointing to me as well, that we were here in court Monday. They could have handed me this supplemental discovery disclosure when we were here in court. But no, they filed it after our hearing. I didn't get the flash drive until Tuesday. And I still haven't gone through all of it. It's 10 pages of items, 10 pages that's listing out hundreds of interviews and exhibits that we have not seen yet. So we're getting ready for trial, and now we're supposed to also get ready, go through new evidence that's being hand-delivered to us the month before trial, three weeks before we're starting to select a jury. It's pretty ridiculous, really. And so I have to file now a motion in limine to exclude all of this evidence that they gave to me two days ago. I now have to set another hearing. We now have to annoy the court with more motions to exclude evidence because they've been sitting on it. There's witnesses and interviews here from the FBI in 2020, and I just get it now? I'm just really disappointed. So that will be a motion that's coming. We'll need to schedule that with the court and counsel. I don't have anything else to say. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Who's going to be presenting argument on behalf of the state this morning? I will be, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Blake, I allowed both counsel there, so in whatever order you think is appropriate, you can address the comments and additional arguments made by both counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. I know the court's heard a lot about the discovery in this case, and we've gone over it multiple times, but I would reiterate, and all parties have said this repeatedly, there is a massive amount of discovery and evidence in this case. The bulk of the discovery was turned over at the outset of this case. The bulk of the discovery was actually turned over to defendant's counsel. Now, I recognize Mr. Archibald is newer to the case, but in the prior proceeding, a case that has been dismissed, much of this is the same evidence, and by far the bulk of the evidence was turned over at that time. Because of the massive amount of discovery and evidence in this case, as well as the multiple law enforcement agencies that have been working in this case, the state has gone back through to try to ensure that we did not miss turning anything over. The majority of what has been turned over are items that were located that we did not realize were not turned over. The state cannot turn over what we do not have in our possession. While we understand that discovery in law enforcement's possession is impugned to the prosecutor's office as well, as is very normal with discovery responses, we say as soon as the state has it in our possession, we will get it turned over. That's what's been done here. In addition, when we look at just the Rule 16 of the Idaho criminal rules, much of what the state has turned over would go above and beyond what is actually required. When we look at is the state using some of this evidence in our case in chief, no, we're not. Is it exculpatory? The state does not see it that way. But in an abundance of caution, we are turning over everything. The state is in a position that if we don't turn anything over, they're going to say that it must have been exculpatory or it had some value. If we do turn it over, then we're turning it over late. So the state is kind of in a position where we're trying to do our due diligence and ensure that the defense has absolutely everything the state has, has absolutely everything the state has access to. Let me just raise a point or two here, Ms. Blake. First of all, 
on the argument that they got the bulk of the evidence, these are capital charges. Are the, is the defense not entitled to all of the evidence? If it's, if it's relevant enough to be listed in discovery disclosures from the state, I mean, as far as I know, they get all the evidence. They don't get the bulk or the majority of the evidence. Would you agree with that as a general proposition in a capital case? Yes, Your Honor, and I would agree with that as a proposition in any criminal case. Okay, and secondly, this, this latest new disclosure, which according to Mr. Archibald is voluminous, the issue I've got there, and we're going to hear this, as he mentioned in another motion, in another hearing before trial, our court's scheduling order, which was issued last December, gave a deadline for dis- completion of discovery prior to February 27th. So this, although it's a day late, it's late under the scheduling order. Discovery, all discovery must be completed prior to February 27th, 2023. And the notice of the um, new filing of the discovery It's filed in the case at 4.03 on the on the 27th, so it's late under the court's scheduling order. Again, uh, I've presided over a lot of cases. I know how things get hectic when we're getting close to trial. This is a capital case. The indication today that there's a voluminous amount of new discovery just being handed over after the scheduling order deadline, I'll tell you, it's extremely concerning for the court, and I see Mr. Archibald's notable frustration here of having this evidence now delivered past the deadline that we had all uh, known about for some time. So I do have concerns on the timing here, and sorry to interject in your argument, but I want to let you know uh, how I'm seeing that issue as it's playing out right now. So if you'd like to continue with your argument, Ms. Blake, you can. And. Your Honor, I think um, hearing the court say that it was due before the 27th, I think that may have been, the state's interpretation had been that it was due by the 27th. So we had attempted to make arrangements to get discovery out on the Friday before, and it ultimately went out on the 27th with our belief that that's when it was due. Uh, Let me just read what the order says. Discovery, paragraph two, all discovery must be completed prior to February 27th. 2023. The reason that date is included is because at 9 a.m. on February 23rd, well, we had our pretrial conference scheduled, um, and the point is having all discovery completed and done at the time of pretrial conference, which we heard on that date. So, again, I don't see where there's a question on what the order requires for a deadline. Um, Could have been misinterpreted or misread or overlooked by the state, just focused on the date there, but it clearly says prior to February 27th. So if you'd like to continue with any argument, you may, Ms. Blake. Um, with regard to the specific items of discovery that have been referenced, and I think we've argued those previously, but the 12 terabytes, um, that has been previously addressed by the state. As the state has indicated, that particular discovery, the defense was put on notice of that in the last case. They were provided a copy, and as well in this case at the outset, they were provided a copy of what the items were that had been retrieved from the property and that those were available for review. No request has been made until very recently to get a copy of those. Whether that's a strategic or tactical decision or not, those items were made available. So to try to argue that the state is late in disclosing those is simply an error. Those had been disclosed. They were known to be available to defense and there has been no request until very recently. With regard to the DNA evidence, uh, which seems and appears to be the bulk of the current argument set for today, I know now there's been some additional argument um, raised, but the court already has a history of that particular evidence that's the issue of the discussion today. 
But I think given statements by counsel, it may be important to reiterate some of the timeline with that particular evidence. That particular evidence was discovered or was located, excuse me, in conjunction with some consumptive testing. The reason that's important is we had some evidence that was uh, located at the state lab very early on. In this case, it was actually the point of some discussion, again, in the prior proceedings uh, that preceded the cases in question that are before the court today. Because it was consumptive testing, we needed to wait to get some kind of an agreement or an order from the court. Due to the stay in Ms. Vallow, on Ms. Vallow's side of the case, we were unable to get that consumptive testing order ultimately entered until August of 2022. So before August of this year, the consumptive testing could not take place. Once we received that order in August, the problem was the evidence in question that was going to be tested that was consumptive, the, the evidence in question that linked to the first consumptive order, I guess, to clarify, was not in the state lab's possession. It had been sent back east to another lab for additional testing. That was done by stipulation of the parties. The parties would have known that it was back there. So the state lab had to wait for that evidence to come back for them to perform the consumptive testing. That didn't come back until approximately November 10th. We received the report from the other lab on approximately October 31st. So on November 10th, when that came back, then the state lab was able to be in possession of it to complete the consumptive testing. It's my understanding the lab tech completed that about November 19th. Excuse me, Your Honor, the evidence was set back pursuant to a warrant for testing to the lab back east, but it was not in the state's possession at that time to complete the consumptive testing. When it was returned on November 10th, the lab then was able to get the testing. The initial consumptive testing was performed approximately November 19th. At that time, the additional evidence that's the uh, subject of the current pending motion was located by the state lab. The particular evidence that we're talking about today was not believed to actually have any evidentiary value by the state lab. However, it had the possibility of being tested, and because of that, they collected that evidence at that time. Again, the problem was they could not proceed with the testing because the testing on that particular evidence would be consumptive. Defense counsel was notified uh, as soon as the state was aware of the discovery of this, or not discovery, but the location of this new evidence. Again, we had to wait to get an agreement for consumptive testing. Once we were able to get, uh, the testing was completed in December, we were not able to get that agreement and get an order signed until January 9th. So on January 12th, the state lab received that order for consumptive testing on that newly discovered or newly located evidence and that testing was completed approximately on July 18th, and then they had to wait for the report to be approved, and once that was approved, we were able to get that and then give a copy to defense counsel. So with that, any argument or representation that the state sat on this evidence or did not disclose the evidence that we were playing games or that we knew of the the existence of this evidence is simply not true. We learned of the existence of the evidence just before defense counsel learned of it. With this, again, the lab was not confident that there would be any evidentiary value, and the testing that they were able to do did not produce any DNA profile or any additional usable evidence. Because we were aware of how close we were getting to the trial deadline, the state, although we didn't want any additional testing done on this, we didn't see the value in it given where this evidence was located and how this particular evidence can be transferred about, we didn't see the value in that. However, out of a good faith, we located a lab that could turn around some additional testing on that very quickly. We reached out to defense counsel. We didn't hear back from Ms. Vallow's counsel, but Mr. Daybell's counsel got back to us and said, let's go ahead and have it done. He was in agreement. He knew who the lab was, and he was in agreement with having that move forward. At that time, if 
Defendant Dabel had wanted to have independent testing done. The state was not set on doing the testing. They could have at that point in late January said, hey, we want the evidence and we want to send it to our own expert. Defense has represented, I think, testing would take approximately six to eight weeks. Had he requested it at that time, he could have already had it with his expert and the testing being completed. Instead, he chose to agree to have this, the expert located by the state complete that testing. As soon as we received those results, and again, we're talking about DNA testing that generally does not have this quick of a turnaround, but we were able to find a lab that was willing to expedite and work with us. And then still, it's that we're turning over late reports. That report was turned over immediately when the state got it last Thursday. An additional report was completed, and we received that last Thursday during the hearing. While the timing may be odd, it was a report explaining the process completed and giving a little more information to the parties as to how that was done. It was determined that potentially there could be some additional testing that would be available. The current lab that looked at this said their process would be about six weeks. Um, they could potentially expedite it, but there was no guarantee on that. But if we wanted to reach out, they said we always could to see if they could expedite some additional testing. Again, that lab, similar to the Idaho State Lab, has indicated the chance of finding any actual evidentiary or truly exculpatory evidence would be very uh, un unlikely uh, that that could happen. There's, there's two types of testing that could be done, the STR and the genealogical testing. Isn't it true that one of them may well develop additional information? There's a higher likelihood of the genealogical testing. Uh, that is correct, Your Honor. The STR testing, at least from the state's conversation with the current lab that has it, is the likelihood of that resulting in any profile would be extremely rare, and it would consume the entire sample. Uh, mind you, what the state had done was not consumptive testing either. Those extracts still exist and are available for testing. The genealogical or ancestral could result in some kind of a profile, but that would simply let us know who the person was related to. And based on this particular type of evidence and how it's transferred about in the environments, the likelihood based on the, both the lab's assessment and both the state lab and the second lab's assessment is it would have an extremely low probability of resulting in any kind of truly evidentiary, having any true evidentiary value. I, I guess I, I struggle with that concept based on discussions we had in the closed sealed portion of the record that it appears to me what's been disclosed here is there there is something there. There is DNA evidence. It came f directly from the crime scene. It's indicative of unknown persons that could further be identified through additional testing. Is that an accurate assessment of where this evidence is at this point? Your Honor, the only thing the state would say is I don't know that we can say definitively that the evidence came from the crime scene given this particular type of evidence and how it's known to be transferred in the environment. I don't know that we could definitively say that. I think the state would agree that there is the potential to uh, come up with some DNA profiles that would link to specific individuals. We would agree with that assessment. Okay, and that going back to the timeline you've laid out here, the timeline in order to complete and conclude that testing puts us out at least six weeks from today. Is that accurate? That is accurate. As I indicated, there is the chance they could expedite that process, but there was no guarantee the doctor we were talking to would have to talk to other lab personnel to check on a timeline with that. But there is a potential for the current lab to expedite that proceeding. Okay. Thank you for those responses, Ms. Blake. And, Your Honor, I guess, um, again, I would bring up this evidence has been available and where it was located has been available for review by the defense. And to date, no one has requested to look at that or to review it. We verified with the state lab that the um, items 
of evidence where this particular evidence was located had been available for review. They're in evidence there at the state lab. There's been no request to review those. So the state didn't learn of these until late December or in December, which was the same time we notified the defense of these particular items. I think um, the state had talked before when we're looking at the continuance, uh, we'd cited to several cases, um, state via Choa being 1, 169, Idaho 903, that's an Idaho Supreme Court case, that basically reiterates to qualify for a continuance based on late disclosure, a party must not only show that the late disclosure generally prejudiced the party, but they must also show that a fair trial was denied because there is a reasonable probability that the result of the proceedings would have been different had the additional time been granted. And then also looking to state the Webster 123 Idaho 233, that's an Idaho appellate court case from 1993, and essentially, when viewed in relation to the other evidence admitted at trial, there was nothing to support that the undisclosed evidence would have raised a reasonable doubt concerning the guilt, which would have deprived the defendant of a fundamental right to due process. And finally, State v. Caswell, 121 Idaho 801, that's an Idaho Supreme Court case from 1992. That one essentially uh, determines that even assuming the state's original response was inadequate. We find no abuse of discretion in the trial court's conclusion that Caswell's failure for five months to pursue the matter further and request more specific test information um, or to obtain their own experts precluded them um, from arguing that there was an inadequacy. And so I think when we look at those, this particular evidence, the defense isn't without a remedy as it sits now, and arguably there could be an argument that they sit in a better position now than they could with additional testing, given the fact that we have some DNA evidence that has an unknown source. The defense can still argue that. Presumably they would argue that that is exculpatory evidence. The state would not agree with that assessment and would not concede that this is exculpatory evidence because we simply don't know at this point. Isn't the best remedy really, to sever here, to allow time for the testing so we don't have to delve into all this speculation about what this evidence is? And I would argue no, um, given the fact that case law regarding severance, and I know the state cited to it multiple times, but it's disfavored when the pro parties are properly joined, and it's disfavored for multiple reasons, including judicial economy, efficiency, and also fairness to the defendants. With a joint trial, we avoid unfairness or, excuse me, inconsistent verdicts. Um, in addition to the fact we avoid one party gaining an advantage by watching the other party be tried and gain that tactical advantage um, in relation to the other defendant. So I think when we're looking at the requirements with severance, it's essentially, essentially meant to be if there is no other possible remedy available. The state would argue there is one other possible remedy available that the court could consider. And that would be to simply continue the trial as a whole and delay it to start in either May or June. Representation by defense counsel is this additional DNA testing would take six to eight weeks with his expert. And that's if I haven't heard from the expert if he's deemed the necessity of this or where exactly they will go with this, but the representation is six to eight weeks. Ms. Vallow was arraigned last April. Then there was a motion to stay that resulted in a delay in her case, which was filed on October 6th, and the trial was vacated on October 18th of 2022. If we factor in the delay that was uh, a result of that motion to stay or toll the time and vacate the trial, if we factor that in and the trial were delayed to start into May or even into June, um, at the beginning of June, we would keep her within the one year from her, from the date that she was arraigned. And given the profound uh, cost and time in trying these, the fact that these are conspiracy cases and there is a strong favoring of trying conspiracy cases together, that it would result in the state essentially trying the same case twice, bringing in all the same witnesses. In addition to the fact, um, I think one additional factor the state can consider is in State v. Risden, uh, 151 Idaho 244, that's an appellate court case from 2012. Um, it reiterates that when the reason for the delay is well-defined and the reason on its face clearly does or clearly does not constitute good cause, there is no occasion to consider the other Barker factors in assessing a claimed violation. I think when we look at that, if we keep her start date within one year, I think there's clearly good cause to continue it. 
And the other, if, if the court. Mr. Blake, on the speedy trial issue, just, there's a lot of factors that weigh into those decisions. And one of the things this court has to look at is not just the arraignment date, because she was arrested and incarcerated in what I'll call precursor cases. And she hasn't been in jail for a year. She's been in jail, I think, for over two and a half years and has never waived speedy trial in this case. But there is a line of cases out there that you don't just consider the dates in the case at bar. You consider overall a person's constitutional right to not have to endure excessive incarceration before trial if they assert that right. And she's been in jail much, much longer than the year you're referring to. And that, I think, has to factor into a decision of whether or not these cases need to be severed. The other point I'll just bring up is, as you well know, because we've been to Ada County multiple times coordinating, it's a large courthouse with a lot going on and a lot of other trials. And they are hosting the trial in this case. And we really don't have the luxury of just telling them when trial is going to be. We have to be able to work with them to coordinate that. And we've done it twice now, first for the trial that was scheduled to start in January, now for the trial in April. And information that I've got in talking to their administrative district judge, I don't believe it's possible for us to start a trial just in May or June. I think that if trial gets continued, they may not be able to do it until much later, possibly towards the end of the year. So that's another concern. If we had the ability to simply pick and choose dates, that's one thing. But there's a lot of factors that come into play. I am fully aware of the cost, the time, the resources being taken into account here. But that's the reality. And when we talk about judicial economy and efficiency, these are policies that this court has to consider also. And we can't simply go in and impose on Ada County the date that we say it's going to be tried there. It has to be coordinated. So those are two huge issues I see in front of me on this decision. Number one, if it were to be continued, a huge concern I have of violating the right to a speedy trial. And secondly, again, the time of delay, I don't know how long that would be. So I do appreciate the argument of that being a potential remedy. But I just want to be up front with you about how I see that as a practical matter, whether that is something this court can do without violating the constitutional rights of the co-defendant here. So I'm just giving you my perspective of where I see things. And I'll be happy to hear any continued argument, Ms. Blake. Thank you, Your Honor. I would also look to State v. Campbell, 104 Idaho 705. And that's an appellate court case from 1983. When we look at that case, it was a co-defendant case in which both had had multiple pretrial motions that were filed. One defendant later tried to argue that his speedy trial rights had been impaired by the delay resulting from consideration of the motions filed by his co-defendant. However, what the court ultimately found was Campbell voiced no objection or resistance to the simultaneous consideration of his motion with those filed by the co-defendant. All motions were decided in the same proceeding. In our view, had that situation not been agreeable to Campbell, he should have taken affirmative steps to alter the procedure. It is clear that where delays in bringing a defendant to trial are caused or consented to by the defendant, he is considered to have waived his right to be tried within the time fixed by statute or required by Constitution. The State would argue I think the court could consider that as well. The position taken by Ms. Vallow's defense counsel today is that while she is asserting her right to speedy trial, they have concerns with this evidence as well. They also believe this evidence should be tested. So I think we have kind of two positions being taken by Ms. Vallow as well and her counsel. So in addition, the State would indicate, and I don't have the case law in front of me, but I know we've argued this previously, when we're looking at a time computation, and this was dealt with in Ms. Vallow's motion to dismiss based on lack of speedy trial, when we look at the actual time computation, time is not computed for prior unrelated charges or prior charges that were not substantially similar. And based on the analysis done there, the charges were not substantially similar to count that time 
While the state is cognizant and understands Ms. Vallow has been incarcerated, a large part of that incarceration was due to um, commitment proceedings during which her case was stayed, and the state had no control over that, and that was a delay attributable to the defendant. The state recognizes that was pre-arraignment, but I think a significant amount of the time spent is with regard to that. I recognize the difficulties with scheduling this with Ada County, but I think if ultimately, um, given the time cost and the other reasons that support um, joint trials and joint and defendants properly joined remaining together, maybe there would be another remedy available in holding a trial somewhere that could accommodate a May or June uh, trial setting. Um, I think if we were to do that, it would allow Mr. Pryor the testing time. In addition to the fact, if there is good cause to continue Mr. Daybell's case, it seems that that good cause would also apply to Ms. Vallow Daybell's side of things. I think that's all the state has. All right. Uh, thank you for the argument, Ms. Blake. Let me go back to any rebuttal argument at this point now that the state's offered their position. Mr. Pryor, would you like to uh, make any response regarding the state's argument? And you're on mute, Mr. Pryor. And Judge, uh, I would like to make a brief argument. Um, my concern is this, Judge, is that the source of the DNA evidence was in the state's possession effective June of 2020. Uh, August of 2022, there was some uh, evidence in which we stipulated to have testing done. Uh, that was done by stipulation in which in that stipulation I had suggested to the state, and part of that stipulation is that I would have an opportunity to do independent testing. So in June of 2022, the state's expert had a, an opportunity, that's over three years ago, to ascertain what kind of DNA evidence or whether, what sort of evidence they could uh, derive uh, from the source of the evidence. Uh, they then find evidence two years later in August of 2022, and we enter into a stipulation for them to have that evidence tested. And continuing on then until December, Judge, of uh, 2022, which was approximately, what, three months ago, they suddenly then find additional evidence, a significant amount of evidence. Now, the state's, by the state's own admission, their lab and their expert located this evidence in November of 2022. I was informed of this new evidence in December. So for a month after they find it, and this is the state's own timeline, in November they find this evidence, or their expert finds this evidence, they notify the state of this evidence a month later, and then the state discusses, and Judge, at one of the hearings uh, I, I had represented that uh, Mr. Uh, uh, um, the, the counsel for the state, we, we, we were able to, Mr. Wood, we uh, were able to come to a rather quick agreement in regard of having this evidence tested in a lab. The discussion at that time, Judge, in December and January, when we entered that agreement to send it off to this private lab, was, wasn't, well, I don't want to test it, I don't want to have it done. The evidence, Judge, at that time in January was, yes, we want to have this tested, we want to get this expedited, we got this done as quickly as we could to get an independent lab to, to determine what we have here. But at the same time, and... and um, it's unfortunate now the state is suggesting, well, we didn't enter into an absolute written agreement. Judge, we were in a hurry to get this to a private lab. But at the same time, Judge, I have email correspondence where I said, I want to have my own independent testing done. And I want to be able to look at this. Now, we are talking about exculpatory evidence. And there are a line of uh, Supreme Court cases, Judge, that talk about the fact that Regardless of whose fault it is, when there's exculpatory evidence available, and this is exculpatory evidence, the defense has is provided an opportunity to have that exculpatory evidence tested. And Judge, I can give you the sites if you want. There's Williams versus Ryan, 623 Federal uh, 3rd, 1258 from the Ninth Circuit. Um, Judge, there's uh, uh, Harrington versus State, 659 Northwest 2nd, 509 out of Iowa. Uh, there's a significant number of cases, and those actually go to the Brady argument, Judge. But there's also a number of cases that talk about DNA evidence and the right of a defense attorney and his client to have independent testing done 
if there's a suggestion that there's exculpatory evidence, Rhodes versus State, 148 Idaho 215, 2009. Um, a number, a number of cases just talk about this. So it's not a surprise or a shock to the state when I'm sitting here saying I have a right to this evidence, and I do have a right to, to this evidence, and I have a right to have it independently tested. But the, for the state to suggest that at any time I could have called their expert and said, hey, what's the holdup since last August? Why aren't you getting me this evidence? That's, that's, that's almost comical for them to suggest that. And the fact that they've had an opportunity and their expert since June of 2020 to make a determination of where the evidence is and what evidence uh, is, is available is ridiculous. So, Judge, there's two scenarios here. And I have a right to test both scenarios and, 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 and both theories. The suggestion is, is there's, this is exculpatory evidence. And, and, and all indications seem to suggest it's exculpatory evidence. But even if it's not, as the state seems to suggest that, oh, there's a possibility that it's not. Judge, what we have is we either have a exculpatory evidence that I need to determine what it is, or we have extremely sloppy, mishandled processing by these police officers, by the state, and by their own experts in processing this information. And in either scenario, Judge, I have a right to determine what it is. So even if we accept the state's position that, well, Judge, maybe it was just because we didn't do our job and we didn't find the evidence, or that we mishandled the evidence and, and this was sloppily done by our state lab, by our police, and by in the chain of custody, which, by the way, they just gave me the chain of custody uh, earlier in the week, so I haven't had a chance to go through that. In any event, it's either extremely sloppy work by the state side, or it's exculpatory evidence. And in either event, I'm entitled to know which it is. And, and my, my feeling is it's a combination of both. But uh, I need to know, Judge, and I need time to be able to do this. I've made it clear before, and unfortunately, apparently all over the news, but I am not ready, and I'm not going to be ready. And um, I need this evidence to adequately provide the, the defense that I need to provide for Mr. Daybell, and I need a severance in these cases, Judge. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pryor. Mr. Archibald, uh, I want to hear an argument from you as well if you, if you request. We're kind of conducting now an ad hoc hearing going back to revisit the issue of a potential continuance and your client's right to a speedy trial. Uh, normally I like to have things prepared, filed, uh, noticed for hearing. There's uh, an expediency to getting decisions made because of the closeness of the trial setting in your case. And if you're prepared, if you want to address the state's uh, proposed remedy that a continuance to allow Mr. Pryor time for testing would, uh, would or would not impact the speedy trial rights asserted by your client. If you're prepared to address that, you can. If not, um, Go ahead and any, any other argument you've got, I'll consider. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, every day uh, that I visit with my client, we talk about her right to a speedy trial. It is important to her. We filed a motion. <clears throat> the court has made uh, a decision, and uh, and it's something that we'll continue to talk about. If these cases are severed today, uh, then we'll continue to talk about speedy trial. Uh, and so I don't think that uh, that the this late uh, disclosure of DNA evidence justifies uh, taking away my client's right to a speedy trial. And so where Mr. Daybell has already waived speedy trial, that's why his attorney can can ask for more time, and I understand that. And, and I agree with that uh, this DNA evidence does need defense expert analysis. From my client's standpoint, um, she's been in jail three years, over three years now, uh, arrested February 20th of 2020. And so here we are three hours 
or three years later. <clears throat> and uh, she still hasn't had her day in court. Uh, the first case, $5 million bond. Uh, that case was dismissed. Second case against her, million dollar bond. That case was dismissed. And now here we are, uh, and she still has not had her day in court. And so I think there are some uh, problems with continuing the matter unless my client will waive her right to a speedy trial. So, so for example, if this court grants the severance today, uh, as Mr. Pryor has asked for, and grants the continuance, then I'll continue to talk to her about that, about uh, does she want to join in that? Does she want to go ahead and go to trial in April? So, yes, those are ongoing conversations that we have every time we meet, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Archibald. Um, I'd like to allow the state one additional argument there. If you'd like, Ms. Blake, since I brought up the uh, motion as it relates to speedy trial based on your first argument and then just on the response there. So on the limited scope of that, if you'd like to offer any argument. Uh, Your Honor, I think the state had addressed our thoughts with regard to speedy trial. I think um, under the current case law, the, the court could find good cause for the delay. Again, if there's good cause to continue Mr. Daybell's case, I think there would be good cause to consider Ms. Vallow's side of things, especially given her defense counsel's representation that they believe that evidence should also be tested and could hold value. It would seem that there would be good cause to continue hers out. Again, I think it could be continued in such a manner that we didn't go too far past where we're currently set. And, Your Honor, there's no way that I'm conceding uh, what she just said. There's no way I'm conceding that. She's not going to blame their their dilatory tactics on me. Okay. Uh, that'll conclude, then, the argument on pending motions. Uh, I'm going to take a few moments to review those arguments. I'm prepared to make some rulings today from the bench. Uh, let's take a recess. I'm going to say about 20 minutes, so maybe shortly before 1030, we'll come back on the bench and the court's prepared to make rulings at this time. So we will take that recess now. All rise. <laughs> Okay, we're back on the record on cases CR 22-211623, State versus Chad, Guy Daybell, and CR 22-211624, State versus Lori Noreen Vallow Daybell. Court took a recess to consider uh, the additional arguments submitted today as they relate to pending motions filed by the defense. Uh, before the court pending are certain motions from hearings uh, previously scheduled. There's, uh, in the 1623 case, Daybell's second motion to compel. That was filed February 7th, 2023, and heard on February 23rd. The Daybell's second renewed motion to sever, filed February 13th, also heard on February 23rd with continued argument today. And... The motion to dismiss, also filed by Daybell February 10th, 2023rd, which was heard February 23rd and also heard today. Uh, the courts considered the arguments here in the circumstances of this case. We'll note that uh, trial is scheduled to commence on April 3rd in this case with jury selection, or not selection, but... Um, beginning of picking of jurors before that time, so uh, less than a month away. The timing is important for the court to consider as it relates to these motions. Starting off with the motion to compel, some of that's been resolved. The court has considered the arguments. Some of the issues raised on the motion to compel relate to the 12 terabytes of data that were argued to have been lately disclosed. The motions deemed to be resolved based on the representations of Mr. Pryor today that he's 
been able to download that information, uh, so the court will not grant the motion on that issue. Regarding the receipt of tips that had been gathered in 1,188 pages, uh, based on other circumstances and for rulings today, the court's going to deny the motions as it relates to those tips because uh, the court, number one, they were properly disclosed in time, the court finds, although late, and number two, I believe there will be adequate time for the defense to consider those. Uh, the next issue that was brought up and argued extensively and which weighs in uh, to the factor in another ruling I'll make here in a moment is, is it relates to the newly uh, discovered DNA evidence. And when I say newly discovered DNA evidence, it's evidence that was uh, gathered in 2020, the record reflects, but was recently tested, which came up with some testing results that require further testing. On that issue as it relates to the motion to compel, the court will, um, I don't find that a motion to compel would be appropriate to grant at this time. However, the court will order that the DNA evidence uh, be provided to, upon request, the defense for any further testing, um, as has been stated by Mr. Pryor. There is a line of cases that does permit a defendant in exercising their procedural and due process rights to have independent testing done of DNA evidence, including the state versus Rhodes case. So uh, I do find that it's a right a defendant has, particularly in a capital case. What we have here that defense testing is permitted of DNA evidence. So I will deny the motion as it relates to the DNA evidence in that uh, I'll just instruct the parties to cooperate in providing the evidence for further testing if that's requested. And then Mr. Pryor, if there's an issue with further testing, that would need to be rescheduled and heard. Otherwise, I'll leave it up to the parties to deal with any further testing that would come up. The next motion then uh, is the motion to sever. And I'll take some time walking through this decision on the motion to sever. Um, as has been Noted by the state, the case was properly joined for trial, and it's remained properly joined for trial under Criminal Rule 8. There's factors the court's already determined, including the charges, the conspiracy elements of the charges, which, having considered all those factors, I've previously denied motions to sever, and I have found that these cases were properly joined, as well as the counts properly joined for a single trial. At this point, there's been a renewed motion to sever, and it ties directly into this DNA evidence. Uh, the time frames, again, are important here for the court to consider. I don't find that there's been any Brady violations as have been asserted in the motion to sever. And also, I'll note explicitly on the record that um, I know and work with these prosecutors on a regular basis, and I don't believe that in any way they have either intentionally or strategically delayed the disclosure of any evidence in this case. However, the uh, simple fact of the matter before the court is we're now on the eve of trial, and there is new evidence, and having been advised of what this evidence is, um, we know something about what it is and we know a, we don't know a lot about what it may be and I'm not going to engage in speculation to determine what this evidence may or may not show. What we do know is there's something there. What we do know is that additional testing can be done which will likely lead to more information what we do know is that there's at least a real and material chance here that this could be exculpatory evidence. It could also be inculpatory evidence. It could also be evidence of no material value, that there's something there, and that something can be tested to get further answers. But 
all parties agree that under any circumstance that testing cannot be completed by the time trial begins. The testing cannot be then transferred for further testing by the defense before trial begins. And so I've considered how that would impact this case. Again, I found the joint trials were appropriate. It's more efficient. It's more cost effective. There are other factors to consider, such as avoiding inconsistent verdicts and different trials. It's a right that the state has proven it's entitled to in this case. However, circumstances can arise, and the court also has to consider whether or not going forward with a joint trial in this case would impair the due process rights of the defendants. The question is whether or not unfair prejudice would result. Under Idaho Criminal Rule 14, severance can take place, and that rule says if it appears that a defendant or the state is prejudiced by joinder of the offenses or defendants in an indictment. And then the court may grant a severance of the defendants if it appears, again, that there would be unfair prejudice. There are some cases that the court's reviewed that define further what that may mean. The Ochoa case that's been cited by the state, I've reviewed that case. In the Ochoa case, the magistrate who tried a vehicular manslaughter case excluded a toxicology report that was the toxicology of the victim in that case. And later on appeal, it was determined that the magistrate was correct and allowed to exclude that report. And one of the statements in that case of Ochoa, to qualify for a continuance based on late discovery, a party must not only show the late disclosures generally prejudice the party, but they must also show that a fair trial was denied because there was a reasonable probability that the result of the proceedings would have been different had the additional time been granted. In Ochoa, there was, as it is stated in the case, Ochoa asserted what they called a bare claim that she was prejudiced by the late disclosure of a full toxicology report. And that was, I think, the day of or the day before trial. I see some distinguishing factors from Ochoa in this case. Number one, these are capital cases and we're not on the day of trial or on the day before trial. We're not dealing with a bare assertion that we might have evidence here that would change the result. And what I'm absolutely not willing to do is engage in any speculation about what this new DNA evidence may end up revealing. If we were to just roll the dice and go to trial and have this continue to be tested and find out later on, well, it really wasn't anything, then we'd be okay. If we find out later on or during trial, well, it was something. What do we have then, a mistrial? Do we have convictions that have to be vacated because of this new evidence that we knew about before trial started? And the decisions before the court now. And in this case, again, just discovery of this evidence and when it's been disclosed does not require a severance in this case. What I believe and have determined does require a severance is the fact that trial is scheduled to start when I've indicated that it's undisputed that the further testing, which would lead to more answers about this DNA, cannot be done by the time of trial. And we have a defendant, Mrs. Vallow Daybell in the 1624 case, who has not 
and will not waive her right to a speedy trial. So in order to deal with this evidence, I find that by going forward, if I required Mr. Daybell to start trial without knowing what the evidence was, that would deprive him of procedural and due process rights to be adequately prepared for trial, and more importantly, to potentially obtain what may be exculpatory evidence in the case. So I'm not going to do that. So my first finding then is that Mr. Daybell is entitled to have his trial continued based on the request because of the disclosure time of this DNA evidence. So where Mr. Daybell's case gets continued, then where does that leave us with the 1624 case where Mrs. Vallow Daybell has not waived speedy trial? There's been an argument by the state, which I have strongly considered and looked at, that we could still keep these cases joined for trial and not have to sever them under Rule 14. If a delay in order to allow additional time for testing were imposed by the court and force a continuance in that case against her right and without her request, the court has to go back and look at the factors of speedy trial, which have been brought up today, and under the Barco v. Wingo factors, there's four factors there the court looks at, the length of the delay, the reason for the delay, when a defendant asserted the right and prejudice to the defendant. It's clear that in this case the right was asserted from the beginning. She's never equivocated on that. The reason for the delay, again, without laying personal blame on anyone, it's the state's evidence that was gathered in 2020 and has gone through different stipulations, issues about whether it would be consumptive or not, but the reality is just very recently here this evidence now has been discovered that can be additionally tested, and the reason for delay there has to be attributed to the state in that case. The length of the delay, if I were to continue this, because the matter has been transferred to Ada County, I don't believe it could be a short delay. I think it would require a lengthier delay. I would, based on information I have, think it would have to be more than six months additional. And if there were a way to even fast track that and minimize the delay, I still have to consider that fourth factor of the prejudice to the defendant. And part of the thing you look at is not just the procedural history of this case and when arraignment took place, but you have to look at the total time that somebody's been incarcerated. And she's been incarcerated, as Mr. Archibald said, I guess it's over three years now on evidence directly related to the charges now pending in this case. And I do understand there were significant periods of time attributable to the defense in the delays with the mental commitment proceedings. But beyond that, in this case, since those issues have resolved, there's just never been any equivocation on that right. And so if I force a continuance here, then I have to violate Mrs. Valadeva's right to a speedy trial, the way I weigh those factors out and, again, considering those factors which I've previously considered in this case. We've already gone beyond time under the Idaho statute, which I believe was justified and determined in the last decision, but I don't find that a further continuance because of this late disclosure would withstand a challenge on the constitutional basis of that asserted right to speedy trial. So given the unique circumstances of this case, I've also looked at the standard on severance under the State v. Fox case. That's a recent case, 170 Idaho 846. And 
That state's Idaho Criminal Rule 14 provides a backstop to prevent joining charges in a matter that may unfairly prejudice a defendant. And I would find that continuing to uh, require Mr. Daybell to go forward without having an opportunity or time possible to test the evidence to determine what it is uh, would result in an unfair prejudice. Um, it would simply require too much speculation for the court to guess that this evidence isn't going to matter and isn't going to impact the defense. Mr. Pryor's stated that it would. It's logical that a defendant wants to know whose DNA is it. Is it a crime scene? It's pretty elemental, I think, in looking at how one may defend a case. It's a capital case. There's extra precautions that should be taken there to ensure the right to a fair trial. It's been discovered before trial. And upon consideration of all these factors then, uh, I am determining that a severance has got to be made in this case, and I have to allow a continuance of Mr. Daybell. It's not a decision I've reached easily. It's been a lot of time and work and effort to have this case prepared to begin trial, and the courts have done everything to make sure We've been ready to go on the dates that are set. It's disappointing. I know it's uh, going to increase costs for the county. It's going to require potentially two full separate trials. Um, but I have to balance these rights of uh, these defendants in this case. And so that's the court's decision under Rule 14. I do find that because it would unduly fair, unfairly prejudice Mr. Daybell's rights to be forced to go to trial with this new discovery. Severance is the only option I see. So the renewed motion to sever is granted, and the court will sever the trials. I'll still be maintaining all the dates of the pretrial setting uh, in the order in Mrs. Vallow Daybell's case, and her case will remain on for trial and will go to trial. On April 3rd, the court will vacate the trial setting as it relates to Mr. Daybell, and a new trial date will be scheduled. The final motion under advisement that I want to deal with today is the motion to dismiss or alternatively to strike the death penalty. That was a motion filed on February 10th by Mr. Pryor, and it does tie into and relate to Again, the issue of evidence that he claims was lately disclosed and should result in sanctions. Given the court's decision on a severance and having fully considered those new arguments, uh, I don't find that there's been a Brady violation at this point. I don't find that there's been any conduct which would justify the extreme sanction of a dismissal of the indictment or alternatively striking the notice of intent to seek death penalty. I think the concerns brought up in that motion to dismiss the indictment have been resolved through granting of a severance and granting of a continuance in that case to allow additional time for preparation. So that will be the ruling on that motion. So those three motions have been ruled on. Um, I'll start with Mr. Pryor then. Those were your motions I ruled on. Do you have any questions on the court's rulings at this time? No, Judge, and just, just for the record, the 12 terabytes has been um, uh, identified as being prepared for me to pick up. I haven't been able to download it. I will be picking it up shortly. So that's just a clarification, Judge. I don't think it has any consequence, but there's no other uh, uh, questions, Judge, on the court's other rulings. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Blake. Do you have any questions on the court's rulings today? Um I, I guess we kind of, we basically have a request. Um, given the court's order to sever, which the state respects the court's order, um, while that was not what the state was hoping for, we would ask if the court would inquire on the record if Miss Vallow is waiving having her counsel explore these additional DNA findings. I think, um, essentially we've kind of had two separate things addressed by, uh, Ms. Vallow Daybell regarding believing that there may be value in this evidence, but also maintaining her right to a fair trial, which the state understands. 
but it appears that um, she would be choosing speedy trial over her ability to test um, that evidence additionally. So I think we would just ask for some kind of inquiry on the record to reflect that um, so that we don't have invited error by Ms. Stabel. All right. Uh, before I ask for a response on that from Mr. Archibald, I think the record's been made pretty clear that defense counsel would like and likely need more time to explore this evidence, however, have been directed by their client to move forward with trial as scheduled. Um, so I understand that. I don't know if I should or am willing to require some kind of a waiver on the record to that effect. It's a defense strategy and a clearly an issue that the defendant needs to be made aware of and explained. Uh, but Mr. Archibald, if you have any questions on the rulings, uh, you can ask at this time. And if you'd like to address that request from the state, you may as well. I don't have any questions about the court's ruling, and no, I'm not going to answer the state's question. Okay. That will uh, conclude the hearing on the motions today then. Uh, counsel, given these developments, we'll reach out, and uh, we do have hearings scheduled again a week from today, I believe, on the 9th, and I'll likely be reaching out to counsel before then as it relates to the impact of the court's decision to sever the cases. Uh, going forward, so just for some scheduling purposes, I'll reach out in a ministerial way off the record through counsel, through my staff attorney here, just to determine whether we want to have any sort of a planning discussion before the ninth. So uh, if you'll watch for that, that will conclude the matters taken up before the court today, and we'll be in recess. All right.